Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome to the stage, Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Joe McCord. So we're going to, talk, going to be talking about protandum, NERF2 activation, and a little more about gene expression, which is really uh, the important meat of what protandum does. By way of a, a review, <clears throat> this is a slide most of you have seen before, and it's kind of the briefest explanation I can give you of what protandum is what it does. What is protandum? It is a NERF2 activator, and if this is your first time, it probably doesn't mean anything to you, but I keep saying it will. So stay with us. In the next decade, NERF2 activation is, a, is going to become as commonly used a phrase as cholesterol lowering has been in the past decade or two. A NERF2 activator is in fact a biochemical wake-up call. And occasionally your cells need to be awakened. NERF2 does it. What does protandum do for us? It provides protection against oxidative stress, and you've heard a lot about that in the last six or seven years from us. Inflammation, you've heard a lot about that in the, maybe the past five years. Fibrosis, scar tissue formation, process that leads to, can lead to lung failure in the case of pul pulmonary fibrosis, can lead to heart failure in the case of cardiac fibrosis. Carcinogenesis or formation of cancers, and we've talked about that a number of times. Uh, there are three papers of the nine that address carcinogenic mechanisms related to oxidative stress, and a number of other stressful conditions. Protandum does this by regulating gene expression. It's not doing it by the direct action of any synthetic drug. It's not even doing it by the direct action of any phytochemical. It's doing this indirectly by messaging, by biochemical messaging. And very quickly after the stimulation is provided, everything that happens within these cells is the result of things those cells already know how to do, and in fact, things those cells have done since their beginning, but they don't always do enough of it, and they don't always do it in the right time. And that's why the chemistry of gene expression needs regulation from time to time. It needs to be told what to do, and we're going to find out <clears throat> exactly how that happens. This is a schematic, and again, it puts it as concisely as I know how to do in one cartoon, an animated cartoon. This cell represents any human cell. It has a nucleus containing a vault of blueprints, and within that vault is everything required to define who you are and what you are. Your vault of blueprints is unique, it's unlike anyone else in the world, unless you have an identical twin. And it's, it's the same in every cell. They've all got the same genes. What makes one cell different from another is they express those genes differently. So a brain cell has genes that only brain cells express, a kidney, other genes that only kidneys express. To regulate gene expression, substances like protandum, which is the purple figure in the upper right corner here that represents any one of the five active ingredients in protandum. And when it approaches any human cell, it binds at a receptor. Uh, the analogy I've used and will continue to use is this is like someone stepping up onto your front porch and ringing your doorbell. So that's what protandum active ingredients are doing to every cell in your body when you take it. And when protandum rings the doorbell, that causes changes inside the house, inside that cell. So what happens? Ringing the doorbell, first of all, activates an enzyme called a kinase. It's not so important you remember what that is, but it's an enzyme that can modify other proteins inside the cell. And this kinase acts on a little red protein represented by a red circle here called NERF2 that's being held 
by another protein called KEEP1, represented by the blue circle. So KEEP1 holds NERF2 in the cytoplasm. That's the part of the cell outside the nucleus, outside the DNA vault. Until it's modified by this protandum-activated kinase, and that introduces a phosphate group. You see that little yellow circle with a P on it. It has changed the chemical structure of NERF2, and when that happens, the blue protein releases NERF2. So it can now float around in the cytosol of the cell and diffuse into the nucleus, where it previously could not go, and it finds about 3,000 of those genes out of 25,000 that have a specific switch that NERF2 can bind to, and it's a switch like a dimmer switch on those 3,000 or so genes, and the action of protandum binding to those genes increases the activity of that master blueprint, those 3,000 genes. So instantly, not instantly, but within a matter of a, an hour or so, working copies of that master blueprint for those 3,000 genes is sent back out to the cytosol, translated into new proteins, new enzymes, and among those are numerous protective enzymes, including the antioxidant enzymes, anti-inflammatory proteins, antifibrotic proteins, and a whole family of genes that are collectively termed survival genes or stress response genes. So they enable cells to get through stressful periods of several different uh, sources, oxidative stress being one of them. So in a nutshell, that's what protandum does inside your body to, <clears throat> to every cell in your body. One year ago, um, I presented at Elite Academy in San Diego, a presentation <clears throat> that was based on a, a big analogy. The medical students used to call me Dr. Analogy because that's the way I teach things. Uh, if you understand an analogy, it can help you understand uh, sometimes a very complex process. So in this analogy, I likened your 25,000 genes, and especially the 3,000 of them that respond to protandum, to the keys on a giant piano. And a piano uh, has to be in tune to sound right. If you look up the, the um, definition of tune in an online dictionary, this is what you find. Um, and there are several, several definitions. One is to adjust in musical pitch, which is what we're talking about when we tune a piano. Um, a second definition is to bring into harmony, to adjust anything for precise functioning, and we use the word to tune up a car. If you drive a car for 50,000 miles, it needs a tune-up. It needs to be adjusted to bring it back into perfect operating order. And uh, here under the first definition, you see an example. Uh, someone tuned her guitar, brought every string into perfect pitch the way it should be. And I predicted a year ago, if you look up uh, the definition of tune in about 10 years, you may see an addition that says, Grandma tuned her genome with protandum. <laughs> so, so maybe we will redefine what, what tuning means. But each gene in your genome needs to be expressed at a precise frequency, just like that frequency that determines the pitch of that string. And on a piano, every key, all 88, have a very specific frequency assigned. And for proper functioning in a given condition, every gene in your body needs to be expressed at, a, at an optimal frequency. They need to be tuned. I showed you this example as well. Suppose grandma bought a new piano 60 or so years ago. And when she bought it, here we're looking at one octave from low C to middle C. Each of those 13 keys had an assigned frequency, and when the, the store delivered that piano, it was probably in perfect tune. So you strike middle C, you get that frequency. But if that piano's been sitting in the, <clears throat> in the attic for 40 or 50 years, time takes a toll. Uh, things stretch and shrink, and as we age, that happens to all of us. 
And after 50 years, you strike those 13 keys, they're not gonna be in perfect tune, they're off frequency. And your ear can hear it immediately. If you play a song on that old piano, it's not gonna sound great. It needs to be retuned. And that's what Protandum does to this large subset of genes in your body, 3,000 genes, are gonna be retuned. I showed you this a year ago. This is <clears throat> looking at the expression of about 400 genes that are nerve 2 responsive, pretty much selected at random and sorted uh, on the basis of, of their expression levels. And with 400, you, you still can't look at individual genes. You, you've got an enormous amount of data. So we zoom in on that little red box to this slide, which looks at about 60 genes out of really about 3,000 that are affected. And these are from a cell, from a plate full of human cells that have been treated with protandum. And this is the level of those 60 genes expression when those cells have been in a protandum containing solution for about 24 hours. If we take a companion dish, the same cell line, the same cells grown for 24 hours without protandum, we can compare how these same 60 genes were expressed. And this is what it looked like in the cells grown without protandum. And about two thirds of them have been elevated. Where you see the green bars above the red, those genes have been upregulated. But there's another set of genes, about a third of them, where you see they were highly expressed, big tall red bars. Those have been downregulated by protandum. So it's just like tuning a piano. If it's out of tune, it can be either direction. You got to get it right back to where it should be at that precise frequency. This is a rather dramatic presentation of only 60 genes. And the real problem facing us when we know that 3,000 genes are modulated is what do those genes do? We would love to know for every one of them, why is this gene in your body how much should it be expressed? What happens if it's overexpressed or underexpressed? That's an onerous task, a lot of data. And to help interpret that, you really need some assistance. Uh, <clears throat> Brooks Hybertson and I were looking at this slide earlier in the week, and this slide with 60 has the gene abbreviations below each of those genes, so that, that specifies what those genes are. And right in the middle of this slide, there's a gene here pointed out by these arrows. And Brooks said, look, that's, that's um, transforming growth factor beta, TGFB1. That's one gene we happen to know because, because we're familiar with it. I would love to be familiar with all 60 of these. I'd love to be familiar with all 3,000, but I'm not. And in fact, no biochemist is. This particular gene is one that controls fibrosis. Right? It causes star scar tissue to be formed. When this gene is overregulated, as it was here prior to protandum, it can lead to collagen deposition in the heart, in the diaphragm, in the lungs, any internal organ, leading to the ultimate failure of that organ. All right? As we get older, this tends to be expressed more. Many diseases of aging have this kind of increased expression of TGF beta. The other 59, frankly, I didn't have a clue as to what they do because I don't carry that knowledge around in my head. So how can we come to grips with all of this data and interpret it? The paper that came out earlier this week in Molecular Aspects of Medicine um, goes a long way in solving this dilemma that we faced a year ago. So I want to tell you what has happened in that year and how we have kind of backfilled that information uh, with some useful, useful uh, information to help us interpret exactly what Protandum is doing. There's a company to help deal with this huge volume of information. It's an online company called Ingenuity. Um, the, the name itself is a, a play on words because they deal with genes and they're a very clever company uh, in helping you figure out how to interpret gene expression. And the way this works is you subscribe to this company's services. 
and you can upload the results of your experiment. And that's exactly what we did. So we had plates of petri dishes, cell, human cells grown in the presence, the absence of protanum. We did gene array expression, which I described for you. That's how we got all of that data. The question now is, how do we interpret it? And Ingenuity can do it for you because it's a database that is in communication with multiple other databases. Everything that's published in PubMed Ingenuity knows about. All the genes that have been published in a, a similar database called GenBank, it knows about. There's a protein database, SwissProt, that it knows about. So it combines myriad databases with an enormous amount of information in each one, and for every one of the 3,000 genes that we send to Ingenuity, it finds those connections. What is this gene? What, uh, what regulates it, when is it upregulated, when is it down. Very importantly, what diseases are known to involve this particular gene, one by one through all 3,000. What pathways does this gene participate in? What are the other genes it communicates with? And here you see, in fact, the first thing it tells us. Ingenuity confirms that NERF, the NERF2 pathway is strongly activated by protandum. So it will tell us pictorially like this, and I don't expect you to read the fine print, but it points out every biochemical pathway that it knows about that has been significantly modified by the treatment, in this case, growing cells with protandum. And this is the NERF2 pathway, and it's central, and it pops up strongly. And it shows you at the very top things that happen in the extracellular space, one of those things you probably can't read is, it says oxidative stress. And when you come in inside the cell, the figure that is right at the center of this thing, uh, in the lower center, is n the NERF2 gene itself. And all these other uh, representations are other genes that communicate in this pathway with NERF2. And this diagram continues. This is showing what happens in the nucleus. So when protandum activates NERF2, it moves from the previous slide into the nucleus, interacts with the DNA. All of these genes are affected. The, the column of, of things on the right are antioxidant proteins, which is a small part of what NERF2 does. So, so this program is telling us a lot of information as to how these genes interact. Another thing it can do is shown here. It's telling us what pathological states, what disease states are going to be affected by the change we saw when these cells were treated with protandum. And so here are a number of different pathological states are represented by these blue bars. Uh, the very highest one, which has a significance level that is about 99.9999, and that goes on for 29s. So it's virtually 100% certain that that uh, state, which is cell division, which is very closely related to cancer, which is a disturbance of how cells divide, the next bar almost as high is cancer. So it's saying that these 3,000 genes that you have affected by whatever you did before you sent us the data tell us that genes involved in cancer are absolutely affected. And that continues, all of these have actually very high significance, even the lowest blue bar uh, on the right side um, has a significance of 99.9% certainty that that's involved. And you can't read what, what these are, but it involves cancer, as I mentioned, pulmonary diseases, respiratory diseases, genetic diseases, inflammatory diseases, neurological diseases, <laughs> the whole spectrum. <laughs> and what I, I, again, if I went through every one of them, we would be here for a couple of weeks. So what I did is picked out three representatives. I selected them to get the smallest number of genes because I can't put a slide up that shows you 1,200 genes. I found a couple diseases that you will recognize that are characterized by relatively small numbers of diseases, and I want to look at three of those. And if you look be below, these data below, for each of those categories, 
<clears throat> for cancer, for example, there may be 50 subdivisions. So th there, there may be lung adenocarcinoma, there may be colon carcinoma, there may be cancer of the pancreas. Each of those has its own characteristic cluster of genes involved. And this is one of the smallest groups I could find, but the disease is one that's important, atherosclerosis. And this is actually a subset of cardiovascular disease. Atherosclerosis, which literally means hardening of the arteries, is the process of plaque deposition in the artery. It doesn't even go beyond that to the plaque rupture and the formation of a clot, the formation of a heart attack or of a stroke. So this is the beginning of that process. And Ingenuity identified in our population of 3,000 genes, 19 that are clearly strongly associated with atherosclerosis. And here are those genes in one table. And if you look at, um, there are a number of things I want to point out here. For each of the 19 genes, if you look on the right, you see either a red arrow pointing up or a green arrow pointing down. If the red arrow pointing up is there, it means that gene is overexpressed in atherosclerosis. So um, I think, what, 17 of the 19, I believe, if I'm seeing it properly, are being expressed too high in atherosclerosis. Two of them are being underexpressed in atherosclerosis. And there's a dividing line. If you look, 16 genes are in the top part. Um, three genes are in the bottom part of that. It's not entirely clear always if you look at an atherosclerotic tissue and you see genes that are up or down. Is it, is it being differently expressed because of the disease process or because the cell is trying to recover from the disease process? So cells give you a response. If a disease causes genes to be upregulated, metabolic pathways get tilted and distorted, that tissue may try to re recover, may try to compensate. And the, probably the easiest way to, to think about that is in terms of oxidative stress. If a disease process is causing free radical production that may be upsetting that cell in a number of ways, if you look at the gene expression, the cell may be upregulating its antioxidant genes, trying to compensate. Okay, so that's a good thing in that case because it's compensation. It's not part of the disease process. It's part of the cell's reaction to the disease process. So that makes it a little bit vague and hazy. But in most cases, there's re abundant research behind every gene in this table. So we know that it's doing a bad thing or we know that it's comp compensatory trying to do a good thing. So anyway, you can see that most of these genes are strongly upregulated. And <clears throat> the question then is what happened when the cells were grown in pro tandem to these levels of gene expression? And what do you think happened? Look at those first, uh, uh, that series of red arrows going up and two arrows going down. When these cells were grown in pro tandem, this was the effect of pro tandem. All right, so in 16 of the 19 genes, pro tandem opposed the disease process. If, if atherosclerosis is cranking a gene up, protandem eased it back down. If you look all the way back on the left, the left column, some of those genes are in boldface. And what that means is, in the past several decades, medical science or big pharma companies have produced drugs to treat this disease. And all of those bolded, uh, I think there are 11 of them, uh, but you can count the bolded ones. There's a drug on the market designed to correct the expression of that gene or the activity of that gene. So most of these are enzyme inhibitors. So if you're making too much of something, the drug is designed specifically to target that gene product, that enzyme, and to turn it down. So there are um, four, five, six, I think seven, eight, nine of nine drugs in the top part of that. Um, the ones that have an asterisk, which is all of them in that upper part of the, the curve, the asterisk means that protandum does what the drug that's targeted against that gene does. 
all right? So the effect of protanum is exactly the same as 11 drugs designed to help correct uh, the gene expression problem. And, <clears throat> and in addition, uh, a lot of the genes for which there are no drugs out there to correct. And protandum, again, is, is antagonizing the disease process, trying to correct it. Another example I want to point out to you, and I have to move quickly, in the bottom three, uh, there's a gene um, that is also known as, has an, an alias, it's also known as COX-2. And you may have heard about that in the news media, not so much recently, but in the last decade or two. A whole family of super drugs appeared probably in the late, in the late 80s, in the mid 80s, 80, uh, went into the 90s, that were COX-2 inhibitors, supposed to be a new class, billion dollar pharma products. And among them was um, three drugs targeted to, to downregulate this particular uh, gene product. And you see it's upregulated in atherosclerosis. And the assumption was it's a bad gene. It needs to be turned down. So they made drugs to inhibit it. Well, it turned out cyclooxygenase inhibitors increased atherosclerosis. All right? Science got it wrong, and science occasionally gets it wrong. And maybe more pointedly, Big Pharma got it wrong. And, and the result of that was that three COX-2 inhibitors, after being on the market for a number of years, Bextra, Celebrex, and Vioxx, were withdrawn from the market. Again, a good, a good action. And, and this doesn't mean that there was anything diabolical on the part of Big Pharma. It means that using the information available to you, sometimes because it's science, because it's research, all the results are not in, sometimes you make a, a wrong call. The point I'd like to make is that NERF2 didn't make it wrong. NERF2 increased this gene product. It didn't try to decrease it. So we might have actually learned a, a very important message that could have saved tens of thousands of lives by, the inter by not introducing these drugs if we had been able to look at what NERF2 does in this situation and stay away from inhibiting a drug that NERF2 says should be upregulated, not downregulated. So there's, there's gray area here. Sometimes it becomes clear, as it did in this case, and sometimes uh, we're going to be having to make the best decisions we can on the best um, information that we have at the moment. I'm going to look at another very different uh, disease that's associated here with 28 genes, colon cancer. And you'd think colon cancer would have very little in common with atherosclerosis, right? But these genes are also regulated by NERF2. And these are genes that involve cell division, cell replication. And cancer is obviously a, a case of cell replication gone bad, gone wrong. So here we have um, 28 genes. And again, if you look above the line, these are the ones where the process has elevated almost all of those genes. There's one at the bottom I can see that's downregulated. What do you think protandum does here? Well, this is the effect of protandum in this case, right? And so it opposes uh, all but three of those genes. And again, if you look at the genes at the bottom, um, I, I know, unfortunately, I can't read the fine print, but uh, some of these are, in fact, genes that are uh, compensatory. They're responsive, and you'll see that more clearly in the next set. But this gives you uh, actually strong encouragement that what protandum does tends to counter what this process, colon carcinoma, is doing to that set of genes. And then finally, and this was kind of a surprise to me, Alzheimer's disease, which is a neurological disease. It's not like atherosclerosis. It's not like colon cancer. It's different. It affects the brain, the neurons in the brain. And there's 66. This is a bigger set. So you're seeing the first half of it here. And a large number of diseases. And again, notice that the disease process tends to be genes that are kind of out of control. They're upregulated. The red arrows 
uh, almost throughout this chart. Again, by this time you could probably guess what does protandum do? And again, all of those red arrows are flipped. <clears throat> And if you look at the rest of this, uh, in the case of um, Alzheimer's, this category below the line, where protandum doesn't uh, move things counter to the process, but moves them in the same way as the process. In Alzheimer's disease, a number of the, the genes in this lower uh, segment of the table are antioxidant genes, so they should be going up. They're going up in, even in Alzheimer's cells because of the increased oxidative stress. So they're trying to compensate. In that case, protandum is helping with that compensation. It's boosting it even above where the, the level is. And the very last gene here is one e even all of you should recognize. It's superoxide dismutase, right? <laughs> and so, so in the Alzheimer's cells, because they're oxidatively stressed, they're trying to compensate. They're trying to make more SOD and, of course, protandum causes them to make even more SOD than they're able to compensate. So this is a way, with the help of a very powerful computer analysis program, we're able to look at what protandum does. I've shown you three sets out of maybe 200, and we're going to work our way through most of that data. And we're going to eventually know what virtually all of those 3,000 genes do, which diseases they're associated with. It's not going to be a black box. <laughs> so as we further investigate this, the families of genes regulated by protein, the potential protective effects of NERF-2 